You will note the ominous subtitle. You do in Essex. There is just there is too yes. No, you know nowadays in Hollywood, if there's a popular children's book, they they, they do they stretch the film to two parts to make more franchise. money. Franchise. Franchise. There was just too much material to cover. And, and so I thought I'd do part one and then and then part two at some later date if I'm asked back. So the, 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 one of the major things that I want to talk about tonight is these different ideas of modern architecture, modernism, and what modern is. There is a very deterministic kind of revelational idea of modernism as a type of architecture that came to being in the 20th century and uh, has a certain number of parameters. And that's it, there's one modernism, you know, one modernism to rule them all. And to some extent, brings the history of Western architecture, if not to an end, to some kind of logical conclusion. And that's the way it was talked about and discussed when I was young and for most of the 20th century. But alternatively, and increasingly, people also talk about a more pluralistic uh, a much more contingent view of, of modernism in architecture, in art in general, but certainly in architecture. And the idea that maybe it wasn't so predetermined and so obvious and consequential, but rather there's a mixture of things going on at the same time. It's much more complex history. Um, so going back to the, this idea, the canonical way in which modern architecture and the history of architecture, all of Western architecture, was taught um, and to some degree is still taught, is the idea that there were a succession of organic styles, and I'll explain a bit what I mean by organic, that moved in an inexorable progression towards modernist architecture. Uh, sometimes they had some variations or, 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 or divergences, and they had plenty of regressive kind of dead ends. I've only simplified it here. You know, so this historiography recognizes that not everything led up to modernism, but those were dead ends. You, know, you don't need to know a lot about these things. What do they mean by organic style progression? And that's a term that was used as early as the 1890s, 1900s. The idea that it's architecture of its time, which means architecture that reflects very clearly the new ideas and the requirements of that time, whatever those may be and also architecture that reflects building technology of that time. Um, it also needs to be led by talented, genius-like creative artists, and, uh, and they need to work for clients that have good taste in the Kantian sense of the term, you know, that they've been raised to understand finer things. And that becomes problematic once you have mass wealth and you know, some degree of democracy and access to decision-making because Unlike in the feudal period, an early modern period, there'll be plenty of people that can um, pay you to build a large building or, or a whole neighborhood, but they've got poor taste because they're bourgeois, they're idiots, right? And, and, so, and, so, you need, and so there has to be a barrier to entry to organic architecture. You know, there'll be a lot of architecture in the 19th century that is judged to, to, to be a failure, partly because it's, it's paid for by the new merchant class, by new groups of people. Um, and lastly, organic architecture has to be less about the aesthetics, though there's an aesthetic dimension, and more about the massic, massing and the tectonics, i.e. The, 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 the more engineering bits and the, the voids and, the, and all that kind of stuff. And so if we, if we uh, now focus on 19th and 20th century architecture in this canonical history, uh, you have pre-19th century stuff, then you get proto-modernists. You know, movements, styles that are seen as prefiguring somehow the eventual triumph of modernism. And within that you have some of the rationalist neoclassical stuff of the early 19th century, uh, arts and crafts and associated schools, the Chicago School, we'll talk about that today, the Prairie style. And then these develop into modernism, with Bauhaus, international style, brutalism, high-tech constructivism you're familiar with. At the same time, most of the things that were being built were historicists or eclecticists in the 19th century. These are dead ends, according to this narrative. And then when modernism, and the idea of the modern becomes more strongly established in the 20th century, you have modernistic, like pseudo-modern things like Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Strip Classical. These are also dead ends. Uh, so if you look at uh, Pevsner's 
survey of Western architecture, which is a fairly small book, it's about 200 pages, there is a paragraph about Art Nouveau, and there is nothing about Art Deco. This is written in the 1950s. Because there, you know, what's there to say? There were experiments that, that went nowhere. So that's, that's the established way of looking at it. And in this canonical historiography, there's a narrative arc. There's a kind of Whiggish sense of the arc of history, from proto-modernism, past that ends, to mature modernism, and then post-Steinism, you know, the, the, the kind of modernism that you saw in the middle and late 20th century. Uh, and that was very much an architecture of its time, and therefore organic. It was a, you know, it, it, uh, it quoted or addressed the idea that we lived in a machine age, and also the age of the common man. And so things are to be very industrial and reproducible, and not too much of one place, or, or, or linked to one client, or one institution, but be universal in spirit. Um, and, and this theory of architecture and architectural history falls very much within the, uh, the tradition of people like Pugin and, and, and Christopher Alexander, who opposed a lot of modern architecture, in the sense that it was moralistic. It wasn't, you know, architecture developing in a certain direction wasn't just something that happened in history and we can describe it and try to understand why it happened. It needed to happen. And anything that moved away from that was wrong, possibly morally wrong. You know, it was, it was, it was a terrible thing, or at least a bad thing. So that's the canonical view. The view I'm going to present to you, and I think it's becoming increasingly well established in, in the general historiography. There was a conference last year called Diversity in, in Modernity, and it wasn't so much diversity in terms of the participants, though there was a fair amount of diversity in that too, but in terms of expression of modernity. Uh, and so I'm going to define mo modern in architecture. I will include obviously all these factors, but any architecture really that references the new times in, a, in an explicit way, um, that introduces new ideas, new typologies, and a new type of consciousness, and that at least to some degree renounces some of the um, influence of the past. So you can maintain a little bit of it, not at all, but if, you, if you're completely still basing yourself on precedent, as, as for instance might say Quinlan Terry, who builds you know, very lovely Georgian buildings now, uh, that's not modern. I think we can agree that that's not modern in this sense. It's not modern in spirit, okay? But, but that still covers a lot of different types of modern architectural styles. And so you could say, to use modern parlance, that I view as modern architecture, architecture that identifies as modern. So again, so that's the canonical arc we saw before. And, and, and this is the more pluralistic way of looking at it. Lots of different traditions, lots of different influences, leading to a number of styles that coexisted, and, and, and to some extent even, not always, but usually influenced each other. Um, some downplay the modernity, some, in some cases completely, right? They try to hide being modern, and some emphasized it, but it's a spectrum, you know? I think it's very difficult to be binary and say that's modern, you know, some things were clearly entirely not modern, and some things were achingly modern, but there's a lot of stuff in the middle, okay? And again, focusing just on at the more modern end of things, so we're not going to talk about things that, that refute them uh, and completely turn their back to, to moder uh, from modernity, but things that to some degree or another incorporate in this idea of new styles, new typologies, and so forth. You have these kind of styles that develop or begin in the 19th century and these in the 20th century. And today we're going to talk about 19th century. So we're not going to get to brutalism today or <laughs> hey. rationalism or streamline. If I invite it back, we will get to that because it's very interesting. Tease. Yeah. <laughs> so that nice building that Clayton posted, that's, that's, from, the, that's from the, 19, the late 1920s, early 1930s, if I remember correctly, about 1930 almost exactly. Uh, that's a little war pavilion, and so that, we're not, we won't talk about that today. So, uh, the idea of buildings over time, modernity, blah, blah, blah. Technology obviously has a big impact on these developments. Building technology from the Middle Ages to 1800 actually changed painfully slowly. There aren't any 18th century buildings that somebody from the 1300s wouldn't have been able to build um, with their technology. Some of the Roman stuff <laughs> is a bit more difficult, but, but let's say from the time Europe becomes clearly European uh, until, the, until the 1800, it doesn't change very rapidly. In the 19th century, obviously, the Industrial Revolution is in full swing. The Scientific Revolution 
has become a technological revolution. And so lots of things change. And, and one thing to bear in mind is that it's not just a matter of when was this particular technology available in theory, like say plate glass or you know, iron. You know, iron structures have been possible since the Iron Age. The problem was if you wanted to build a building with you know, 600 tons of iron, it was kind of difficult before you had modern furnace technology, right? It was just not affordable. So it's about not just the availability, but the affordability. And, uh, and just to go back to this idea of modernism as a single path, the idea is that architecture, to be modern, should always visibly reflect. You know, you should look at a building and say, ah, that uses new technology. They couldn't do that 50 years ago. I think that's a bit narrow, but that's part of the story. Um, but all these buildings that we'll talk about reflected technological changes. So some emerging technologies are wide use of cast iron. Okay, it starts, it starts really in the 18th century, but it, it picks up in the 19th century. Steel framing, reinforced concrete. That actually took a long time to perfect, interestingly enough. I guess it's a composite technique. It really only became really practical finally in the 19th century. The safety elevator, um, inexpensive electrical lighting, lots of cheap glass, all these things obviously um, changed the way buildings were erected. Um, also, a big change in requirements. So, you know, obviously, railroad stations, when you have railroads, factories, rapid your urbanization, you know, having to build lots and lots of apartment buildings all at once, much larger offices, much larger shops, and even buildings that have a long history, like libraries and, and, and museums and theaters. You know, in the 19th century, they reach a quadruple in size. And so, they need new, new techniques. So these are some examples of early cast iron and glass buildings, like Iron Bridge in Shropshire and Crystal Palace, which of course burned down twice uh, <laughs> before it was, uh, and, and this is still around, Science House Conservatory. So you already, that's an application of new technology. The style is obviously reminiscent of more classical um, aesthetics, but because the material is so different, you're beginning to see some differences from some, you know, these are recognizably not uh, medieval or, or even early modern buildings. Um, and now we'll talk about a few very important or very often quoted uh, proto-modern buildings. This is 1843, so you know, in the first half of the 19th century. That's the, that's the library of Saint Genevieve in, in Paris. Um, aesthetically, it still recalls some medievalizing aspects, but you can see the cast iron. Right? It's very evident, and it's got these huge, quite large spans, and, and, and the cast iron is actually highlighted. So they're using a new technology uh, in, in you know, quite an out and proud way. They're not, they're not hiding it behind terracotta or stone cladding or anything like that. Another very important proto-modern building is King's Cross Station. If you take out this turret, this could be actually a pretty modern 1930s building. Right? I mean, it's just arches, large spans, very structurally legible, right? A lot of later modernists love that and love this building because every aspect of the structure of this building is visible just by looking at it. It's nothing is hidden, you know? These are load-bearing arches and piers, and you can see, you know, the steel, well, the iron, most of the thing, and, and, and glass there, so it's, it's, it's quite a modern building. This building is, you know, it's, it's very, um, picturesque, right? It's got all these beautiful colored tiles, but technologically, from an engineering point of view, it's quite a modern building. It's a many, many of chocolate factory of 1863. It's an, the entire, from this point onward, there was no load-bearing masonry. It's all iron, okay? That took a special permission from, from, from the government to build it, I guess, they were the facts. for sure it's going to collapse, right? Uh, so these piers are masonry, but everything above this is just an iron structure, which was you know, ultra-modern at that time. You know, these buildings still have a lot of masonry. It's just the spans that are cast iron. Uh, this, like, this is just cladding. Everything else you see there is just stacked onto the iron. So in a way, it's an extremely modern building, even though it clearly references uh, a picturesque idea of the past. Again, uh, the Galerie de Machines at the Universal Expo in Paris. Um, very large span at that time. Um, 20 acres of glass, oh, oh, covered by steel and glass, um, span of 150 meters, the, the largest span up to the point it was St. Pancras, which is still there, was 73 meters, so yeah, it's quite impressive. Um, so 
all these things, and change in technology you can see is beginning to have a big impact on how buildings are put together, especially some relatively specialized industrial buildings. We, most of these are quite specialized buildings that have general purpose. And now we get towards the latter part of the 19th century, and that's where the idea of the modern in architecture really takes over. I've tried to use as much as possible the, the, the terminology that was used at the time. It's a little bit difficult sometimes because we, we're so used to newer terms that sometimes the, the original ones seem um, unfamiliar. Also, the dates as much as possible are the dates when the building was, when construction began. Uh, in some cases, it took quite a few years, so to get an idea of, you know, the latest time in which they could have made any changes. Okay, so we get to the late 19th century and there's lots going on. We've talked about the new type technologies, the new uses, the new typologies of buildings. Uh, the world's gotten, a, Europe has gotten a lot richer very, very, very quickly. And the money, although it's not as distributed as it is today, you know, there are a lot more people, uh, a lot more agents that are able to say, build me a building, I want it in this style, do it this way rather than that way. Uh, from a more soft, and stylistic, and cultural point of view, there was a sense by the late 19th century that the so-called style wars of the 19th century have been quite inconclusive. So in the 19th century, you have some people saying, you know, everything should be built in neo-Gothic. No, 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 neoclassical. Uh, no, let's just build freestyle however we want. Um, and there was a lot of infighting in between architects, but really, in terms of the client base and the general public, people didn't feel that this had been resolved in any satisfactory way, and especially, and this is more in the profession among architects, there was a strong feeling, which I think is generally justified, that there wasn't a clearly 19th century style that had developed. That there wasn't something that you could look at and say, that's really just of now. It has no, it doesn't borrow from the past uh, to a great extent. And at the same time, in the arts, which I think in some cases, in some styles of architecture were very influential, the graphic arts, illustrators, uh, commercial art, uh, you know, underwent a lot of change in the, in the last third of the 19th century, as, as many of you probably know. And so all of that had, was happening at the same time. And so in the 1880s, 1890s, there was a real flourishing of architectural innovation from a stylistic and a theoretical point of view. The first, I'm going to go through a bunch of different styles now. The first one that I will talk about is modern style. It's for some reason, oh, okay, I carefully sourced um, the fonts to be fonts from that from that period, and it, for some reason, it, it died on me. Anyway, modern we, style we, we was We literally called, wouldn't have known. No one here would have known. No. You <laughs> told us this is, oh, this is a font from 1882. <laughs> no, you can see it's not. But it may anyway. be the computer that... The user doesn't have that font. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. They don't come out as a default. Okay. Yeah. So, modern style. That's what it was called, modern style. So, this is one of the earliest, perhaps the earliest style to be just referred to as this is the modern style of architecture. And it was here in Britain, starting in the 1880s. It was particularly strong in Glasgow, but, but it was used uh, throughout. There's quite a few buildings in London as well. Some of the influences, so, Modern style is seen as growing out of the arts and crafts movement. Although the arts and crafts movement actually is very reverential towards the past and the idea of vernacular architecture as opposed to very um, obviously architect created, art, artist created stuff. But some of the stylistic choices and some of the um, moral dimension or social dimension of arts and crafts definitely informed the modern style. Um, there was a lot of interest in, in Asian, especially Japanese art and graphics, and to some degree architecture, especially interior architecture, which is very simple and spare. Uh, there's also an, a, a, an element of the aestheticism, uh, you know, people like Beardsley and so on, in terms of, of um, making art more modern, a bit more challenging, perhaps. And I have to say that there's also a link to architectural eclecticism, which I think most practitioners of modern style would have would have scornfully refuted, but there are definitely eclecticist elements in some of these buildings. Uh, some of the artists that were, that influenced that were people like Beardsley, Liberty, Morris, Ergo, and I think some of the better known architects that worked not only in this style, but also in this style were Macintosh, Macintosh, Townsend, and Voise. Let's look at some buildings. Okay, so first, some characteristics. So they're quite chunky, lithic, 
masonry, the articulation, the way the building is organized is no longer, tends to be not very traditional. It's, it's, and that takes from arts and crafts. So you don't have very symmetrical, classical massing, but quite, uh, quite quirky. Uh, a lot of freestyling, whimsical details, sometimes with some references to medieval aspects. Uh, nice stained glass and glazed style and polished metal. Some of these things are becoming a lot more affordable and being mass produced. Although in these buildings, typically their their art isn't produced. Um, the window arrangements can be a bit sparse, a bit asymmetric, and um, and it's trending towards abstraction. You know, this is the 1880s. Most buildings were really, really florid at this time, with lots of ornament. So the buildings I'll show you don't look that sparse and spare, but for the time they were really shockingly so to some people. And, um, and this was one of the styles that was very much influenced by graphic and, 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 and figurative artists. And a lot, there was a lot of collaboration, at least at the theoretical level. So, Voisy, now some people think that Voisy is purely arts and crafts. To me, this is, goes beyond arts and crafts. This is an 1890 building, okay? A lot of people you see here, architects were born either in the late 50s or the 1860s, okay? So the whole generation that gets involved in this. This is actually very close to where I live in Chiswick. And you can see how it's taken vernacular forms, but they're extremely abstracted, right? Not a lot of windows. Um, and, and, you know, even the brackets, right? It's just a bit of metal there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's considered probably one of the most important buildings in the modern movement. Uh, he also built some industrial buildings. So, you know, there's a bit of ornament, there's a bit of prettiness in there, but it's, the functionalism is beginning to, to be clearly asserted, you know? At this time, you see a lot of warehouses and factories. They still have a lot of gigox and pictures and statuary and things like that. None of that here. It's very basic. Lots of glass. You know, you can see the structure is extremely legible. So it's a proto modern. It's a you know, it's beginning to be quite modern. This is Mary Ward House by by Smith. You see the the, the window arrangements. Um, there's an auditorium in there, which is why that wall is blank. You know, but you know. It's, um, almost anyone following a more traditional style would have put some fake windows in there, some blind windows. You know, it's like, well, why? You know, they're not actual windows, we don't have windows there, let's not put them in. Townsend did some very interesting work. This is the Bishop's Gate Institute, that many of you will be familiar with. So you see some interesting, quite nouveau-ish, ornamental and quite quirky elements. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of glass there and it's just it's not a typical Victorian building. Uh, again, Townsend with the Horniman Museum. You can see some of the massing that I was talking about. It's quite quirky, very bold scale. And, and the openings in the walls are like, you know, much chunkier, much less delicate than would have been popular at the time. And again, Townsend with the White Chapel Gallery. You see that the entrance is off center, um, that big blank space. And then we get to Macintosh, who's the best known of the modern style guys and only really built in modern and increasingly modern styles as time went by. It was quite inventive, you know, very industrial feel to the school of art. Uh, functionalism really taking over. You know, there's, there's, there's very little concession to the idea of Venustas, you know, in, in, in um, uh, Vitruvian terms. And that's again, that's a different aspect of the school of art. Uh, you know, he's building quite a modern building here in terms of everything, articulation, massing, fenestration. Um, the choice of material is relatively conservative because there's quite a bit of stone. Uh, I think that was more or less dictated. Uh, but it's such a new building for the time, you know, 1899. Very strong tectonics, you know, it's, it's, it looks like it could withstand a couple of bombs from the Luftwaffe, you know. I mean, it's, it's a strong building. It doesn't try to be light. And even where uh, Macintosh took some inspiration, which he often did from vernacular forms, in this case of Scotch manor houses, you can see the degree of abstraction. You know, it's inspired by, but it's nothing like a Scottish manor house. You know, and um, this one's got quite nice interiors as well. Um, but, um, so he developed this, 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 this way of expressing himself that, you know, was quite successful. And, you know, he was not vastly successful in his own time in his own place, but he was very influential on other modern movements, which is why I saw it here now. Another thing that starts in the 1880s, both of these before Nouveau, interestingly, although they're often linked to it, is Modernisme, or Modernismo in Spanish. Um, that really started mostly in the Catalonian area of Spain, 
although there's quite a bit in Valencia and other places as well. It was influenced by arts and crafts. It was influenced also by the Catalan revival, and that was the idea that as Catalonia became the first part of Spain to industrialize, uh, it really reinforced the sense of independence and difference from the rest of Spain. And so uh, there was a growing industrial class, and, and they were more likely and more inclined to want to build something different from what they, you know, had been present in their cities in the rest of Spain, something a bit more modern, a bit more uh, daring, if you will. Um, a number of, uh, of artists were involved or were close friends with, with the architects in this movement, people like Casas Utrillo and Picasso to some extent. Uh, and the most famous architects are Gaudí, Dominic, Puig, and Sen I think it's Senya. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. So what are the characteristics of modernisme? You've got a lot of crazy freestyle and eclecticist um, elements, but they're using a much more aggressive, much bolder style. Uh, it's not just a lot of it, it's the way it's putting it. So they have like buildings with scales on them, you know, and that's, wow, you know, that's, that's pretty crazy at that time. A lot of tiles and wrought iron, so, you know, some pretty high-end use of, of craftsmanship. Um, the facade compositions, to some extent, prefigure uh, the Impressionism of the early 1900s. Impressionism in, in architecture is a much later movement in terms of that name. It starts really in 1905, 1908. Um, and some very organic uh, shapes, which you haven't really seen as much of in the modern movement. Uh, and definitely, and not so much abstraction, though. No. They still have a lot of complexity. You're not really making things very, very pared down. Uh, as I said, it was very closely associated with the Catalan nationalism, uh, also from a, which was mostly a literary movement, but also in music and as we see in, in architecture. The most famous architect in this style was Antoni Gaudí. And uh, the first building that we can say moves towards this, this style, away from just pure eclecticism, it's actually quite early, uh, 1884, that they, he had this, um, there was this industrialist, Mr. Guay, uh, who uh, basically was a sponsor for many, many years. You built the Parc des for him and all kinds of uh, outbuildings and, 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 and mansions and so forth. And you can see he started to put some very organic forms and pretty quirky use of materials and tiles and so forth that's, that's unconventional. Uh, he built this for, for Mr. Guell not much later in 1886. Um, I think you can say it has some historicism in the sense that it references some medieval aspects, but the way it's organized is completely non-traditional, it's completely inventive. You know, it's, it's, it, there's no other building before this one you can point at and say like, oh, I, clearly it was inspired largely by that. So he's, he's introducing a huge amount of creativity. This, one of his, this is the second or perhaps most famous house in Barcelona, the Casa Bachion. Which has, which is, you know, it's got water lilies and these very organic shapes. It could be fish mouths, or it's not clear what they are. It's got scales here, like the little mermaid, this little quirky turret. The shape of the windows are very Art Nouveau. This is before, uh, at this point, it's, they're getting some influence from Art Nouveau, which has picked up in France. Um, it's really a very impressive building. It's probably one of the most photographed houses anywhere in the world. When you get there, it's, it's, it's just, you know, you, you can like it or dislike it, but it doesn't go unnoticed. Um, and then it's the Casa Milan. And the Casa Milan is very interesting because it's a bit later, it's 1906. Again, very much, well, I say hints of Impressionism, I think it's almost an Impressionistic building with this curved use of concrete and even brutalism to some extent. And, uh, you know, a fairly... Um, irregular, almost arbitrary use of paint, you know, just the shape of that wall is kind of all curved. You know, it's really pushing the boat out here. Let's remember that most of the stuff that was being built at this time looked nothing like that. It was much more conventional. So he's definitely one of the pioneers. And this is a fantastic interior of the Palace of Catalan Music, which was very much a celebration of Catalan nationality and nationalism, which is just everything and that more, but none of it, these are all sculptures um, and you know, it, it just, you don't know where to look. I think there's some aspects of the interior and that's exterior. Now, this is quite close to eclecticism in a way, right? Because there are lots of little sub-elements, uh, you know, it's, it's very figurative, there's a lot of ornamentation, right? It's not at all spare, 
Uh, it's not minimalist, it's maximalist. But the way they're organized is, is, is new and, and, and quite exotic, and it borrows a lot from styles that are not uniquely historic or European. And now we get to Art Nouveau, I must say where this, this, this spot came through. <laughs> I don't know why. That begins a little bit later, 1890s. It started in Belgium, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, it, it became very popular in France and then throughout Europe, really. Uh, but it really started in Belgium, and uh, it was influenced by the modern style. So a number of architects and architectural uh, critics uh, wrote a lot about the arts and crafts movement and the modern style in England, and there were books that were quite um, influential, especially in Germany, but also in France. So they were, you know, they were exposed to that. There was very much this idea, and you can see that in the art of Art Nouveau, in the figurative art, of exoticism, you know. This is the high period of European uh, super expansionary uh, imperialism, you know, the, I mean, at this point Europe basically owns the rest of the world other than the Americas. And, uh, you know, getting interested in all these different cultures and all these different things that we can, we can uh, imitate or, or draw inspiration from and so forth. And, um, you know, the cast iron proto-modernism that we saw before was quite heavily, you know, used in France. That's probably the country where they did the most work with it. Probably been in the UK as well. But that, that came through. Uh, and, and again, you know, I have to say eclecticism played its role, kind of so-called freestyle. So the architects, you start with Horta, Anka, Guimard, La Birod, blah, 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 lots of them. Um, in terms of non-architectural artists, you know, we associate this with Lalique. You know, a lot of people think of Lalique in terms of the Art Deco output, but that was his successor. So Lalique started working in the Art Nouveau style. Uh, uh, Alphonse Mucha, of course, with the famous Pretty Girls, and, 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 and Louis Comfort Tiffany with the lamps and the glasswork, which were very influential um, in, in the glasswork used in, in, uh, in Art Nouveau. It also, interestingly, I think, had a lot of names at the time. So it got called Art Nouveau relatively early, but it got called Style Moderne, Modern Style Modernisme, Style 1900, Art de l'Epoque, Art fin de siècle, and all that. So there were lots of names for it. And the press covered it very heavily, because once it made it into Paris, Paris being the cultural center of Europe at that time, and you know, from a few centuries before that, once it made it big in Paris, it's like something making it big in New York these days, it makes it big everywhere, right? So if you're Korean cuisine got big in New York, and three years later we had Korean restaurants in Paris, and London, and Germany, and other. same with Paris in those days. It made it big in Paris. Everybody wants to be like the Parisians. So this is probably a style that people are more familiar with. It has very organic, very sinuous, very curvy forms. Uh, a lot of naturalistic and, and organic details, so very much just the idea of nature and a very romantic take on nature and feminine form. Very ornamental, very colorful. Some of these we see, like the use of tiles and glass already starts in the modern style in the UK, but it's used with much more opulently in Art Nouveau. On the other hand, the iron and glass and ceramics, uh, which are relatively new materials, or at least in that scale, are, are very clearly demonstrated. And that gives a sense of modernity of change. Uh, and the massing and the articulation of the building, the way the building is organized, is quite vivid. You know, it's not. You know, in a few cases, you have fairly regular Art Nouveau buildings, but they tend to be fairly up and down and all around curvy things. You know, they're not, they're not somber and serious. And um, It was, I think this is also interesting from a sort of little pseudo-social science point of view, they seem to do better as a style in second cities. You know, I mean, it did quite well in Paris, but it did better in places like Brussels, which is a capital, but I mean, a second tier city in the Francophone sphere. Places like Nancy, Turin, Milan, Barcelona, Lille. You know, in, in cities that were not the major city of the empire. And I think part of the reason for that is that the competition for more neoclassical and historicist styles was stronger in the national capitals because, you know, they're more serious, they're more uh, dignified. You know, if you're gonna build a new building for parliament, Art Nouveau might be a little bit too, you know, too blingy. Uh, but in these new emerging cities, many of which had made their fortune with newly emerging industry, a bit like the story with Catalonia, they thought, like, yeah, yeah, let's just let's push the boat out, let's do something a bit crazy. And so Art Nouveau was particularly popular there. So one great thing about Art Nouveau, it's one of the few architectural styles where people more or less agree who invented it and what the first building was, which is usually almost impossible to track down. So Tassel House, or Maison Tassel, well, is generally recognized as the first building 
That's some very clear Art Nouveau interiors. The organization is still fairly orderly and classical, but if you look at the detail of these columns, it's completely quirky and the ironwork there. And even this funny little curve, I mean, it could be kind of pseudo baroque, but it, it really is. And so Victor Arta had been to the UK, had been to Germany. Uh, I don't think he'd been to Spain, but he thought, let's try something different. And Tassa, again, he had uh, a sponsor, a, a, a rich family, who said, like, let's do something different in Brussels and they built this. And a number of subsequent, to some extent, more prominent um, architect, architects that worked in the Art Nouveau genre said, you know, Arta invented Art Nouveau. He certainly took inspiration from other places, but it was the first purely Art Nouveau place. He also built, he also had other, even richer sponsors in the Solvay family, which was a huge chemical fortune. And, uh, and this was uh, the Solvay mansion, in, also in Brussels. Um, the interiors of this building are just, if you like Art Nouveau, you can just spend the day there because every surface, every bit has some lovely squiggly bit. And, uh, and, and just, just uh, the richesse, you know, lots of uh, frosted glass and tiles and, and um, the, 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 the Claire story is also very pretty. It looks a little bit more serious on the outside, but you can see it's got some nice details there. That's, that's, that's the interior again of the Solvay Mansion, so it's not, not for the faint of heart, it's not minimalist in any way. <laughs> uh, then you have uh, Polanka, who was following very quick on his heels. You can see some very classic Art Nouveau decorations and, you know, um, some moves away from symmetry and certainly in the arrangement of the house, right? It's a, it's a narrow, tall house and it's difficult to build a, a tall, narrow building practically and keep it symmetrical. Uh, but, but here it's, it's, it's really completely ignoring it. The, the, the floors and the stories are at different levels. So let's just be as playful and creative as we want to be. We don't have to do anything just because somebody else did it before. This is the Chapelani Mansion, also by Anka. Look at this kind of, kind of windows and decoration. Um, then, and then we start moving towards Paris and France. And uh, Dumas built some very nice apartment buildings. Most of the nice Art Nouveau buildings in Paris are apartment buildings. The idea being that as they're building the post houseman uh, boulevards, they're building big, tall apartment buildings. Uh, most of them are considerably more sedate than this one. Uh, but there was room, among, because they built, you know, literally thousands of these buildings, uh, for something a little bit more demonstrative and a little bit more with the times and, and, and kind of capturing that sense of the Belle Epoque. So lots of lovely details and, 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 and quirky arrangements and so forth. This is again Guimard with Castel de Angers, who, by the way, was a Catalan family, but in origin. You can see they're doing, you know, all the very organic forms in there. They're really taking that. This column starts as an upright and then it becomes a kind of plant. You know, it's quite... Um, and the thing Guimard is probably best known for still is the metro entrances in Paris, which are a very nice example of Art Nouveau um, graphics and, and iron work. And if you look at the, the Coyot house in, in Lille, um, you know, it's it's like a house built by fairies, right? I mean, you know, it, 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 it's. I mean, it's it's just, it's reasonably legible, but you, I don't know if you can see that. But this wall is at an angle to the frontage of the to the frontage of the uh, of the, to the street front, and here's this nice curve and all kinds of different lines intersecting. So it's it's quite uh, it's quite. Um, this is not impressionist architecture, but it, it brings to mind the impressionist painters. You know, it's 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 it's, um, it's not orderly in any way. And Scholkoff, uh, he's Belgian actually, but I think this this, this building, particularly in Paris, it's um, it's got some lovely details inside. Unfortunately, most of these buildings are difficult to visit, except for open house periods because they're still private residences. And La Virotte was also quite prominent. Again, you can see the kind of wealth of detail and the sense of, of, of um, expression, the sense of, of, of celebration of a time that was just considered, you know, by certainly by people that could, were rich enough to commission these buildings to be a fantastic time, right, the Belle Epoque. Uh, and so it's interesting because going back to this idea of you know, modern modernity, there are trends in, in modernism, you know, towards abstraction, there are trends towards functionalism and structuralism. But you can see that this is very much a modern building of its time, in its time. 
And it's very much new, in fact, new art. Uh, and, it, and it's self-consciously new. It's not new by, by accident. You know, it's, it's really setting out a marker. But it's not necessarily following all those rules. You know, the structuralism is very questionable in a building like this, which almost certainly has some steel structure towards the top, which is not visible. Uh, there's got a lot of ornament. It's not minimalist in any way. So it's modern, but it's not modernist or modernistic. And yeah, we mentioned before some of the um, new typologies. One of the things that, that, that Art Nouveau really got um, used for was uh, department stores. So you got the Galerie Lafayette and La Samaritaine in Paris where uh, very, um, uh, very happy to adopt this style. And I think in a commercial setting, in a retail setting, it was particularly successful because obviously it attracted um, people. It's often also been described as a, as a feminine style. I think that's a... Uh, I, I want to say that's a misogynistic concept, but I think it's a it's kind of a simplistic idea that something is kind of organic and not built to look like a fortress where people shoot at you. It's not masculine, it's feminine. I mean, I think it's a little bit simplistic. Yeah, I mean, all the creators were were men, um, and and pretty much most of them were straight men. So I'm not sure why it's necessarily. We, what you could say is that. During the Belle Epoque, there was very much this idea that, well, certainly apartment stores were, were, were mostly for a female clientele. So there was an idea that maybe you're making more concessions to a less uh, austere um, uh, aesthetic. And that may be because partly the beginning of women participating more, uh, more actively in public life and social life. Uh, Nancy, I mentioned before, has a lot of um, Art Nouveau buildings. They have a museum. One of the London buildings was turned into a museum of Art Nouveau with a lot of beautiful objects because, of course, we're talking about architecture, but along with this in Art Nouveau, you know, that could be a presentation on its own. There's a lot of art, a lot of furniture, a lot of you know, beautiful uh, objects and, 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 and knickknacks. So they've got some of those at the Art Nouveau Museum. It's definitely worth visiting. And Art Nouveau, as I said before, I like Modernisme and the modern style, but as its own style, just went global. And so, you know, from Belgrade to Milan to, to Riga, everywhere, you know, there's some wonderful stuff in Prague. You know, a lot of places that were looking to Paris for inspiration and for leadership looked at that and said, like, yeah, we're doing that too. And, uh, and so these architects traveled quite widely and, and um, you know, some of the products were um, you know, the ironwork and so forth, and there are great craft traditions in these countries, respectively, and so it was uh, adopted very, very widely. Briefly, but widely. And then we get to Jugendstil, which is young, new style. And uh, that's not about Jugendstil. No? Okay. Also the 1890s. <laughs> See, typically, it doesn't start in the center of German industry and government. It starts in Munich, had a big impact in Austria. With, uh, with the Viennese Secession, and then moved on to Berlin. Um, the, the name actually comes from, a, from an art journal, uh, The Youth, and uh, it was influenced by modern style and Art Nouveau. Um, some of the, uh, and you know, you think of artists from well, an architecture side like Klimt and uh, Ekman and so forth, you know, they were a big part of the Munich Secession, the Vienna Secession, which happened almost contemporaneously, first in Munich. And the better known, um, Design, architectural designers were Wagner, who built Otto Wagner, who built a lot of other styles as well, Albrecht and, and, and Hoffman. Well, the country, so again, very uncon unconventional, stylized, the decorative elements. Uh, they're moving away from historicism, but it's much more linear, much square than Art Nouveau. And some people are tempted to say this because they're German, but again, I think it's a bit simplistic. I think that. Um, you know, different, generally, it, you know, some architects will just copy what another guy's doing, but typically they're creative guys that like to do something a bit different. And so what they did was more, more linear, more rectilinear, but they also use a lot of color and brilliance, like in Art Nouveau. And some of the squaring off of detail, especially like the human figure and other uh, representational sculpture is kind of squared off, where in nature it's rounder. That's something that kind of prefigures some of what happens in, in Art Deco. But this is spirit of newness, you know, and, uh, and it's maybe a bit more machine age, a bit less uh, artisanal than Art Nouveau, um, but it has a lot of parallels. Um, 
Germany probably produced more great uh, graphic artists in that space, Austria, but the, most of the really good uh, architects in the style came from Austria. So this is Otto Wagner, who again was a very prominent architect in, in, in Vienna for several decades. Uh, um, so he built in lots of styles, but this is Karlsplatz station, so it's still a very regular plan, you know, but the ornament is, is quite art nouveau, it's quite whimsy, you know, lots of sunflowers and, and, and curvy bits. Um, this is the most famous uh, Jugendstil building. The building itself is very orderly, actually, but the decorative apparatus is, is you know, with all these tiles and color, their organic forms. Uh, and this, you can see, is, is a theme that the, the circle with the three, the triglyph coming down, which is somewhat inspired by, by, by classical elements, but completely transformed. It's very common in new steel buildings. Olbrich, of course, built the, um, the, 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 the headquarters for the, the session hall, for the Vienna Secession, which, you know, has classical massing, but the details are completely, you know, uh, new, including this dome, which is of pierced metal. It's not, you know, it, it's not... Paul. Um, he was friends with the Archduke of Hessen. Uh, and uh, the Archduke of Hessen liked modern new things, and so he built, he, he helped finance this huge artist colony in Darmstadt, and uh, Albrecht designed a lot of buildings there. And you can see we're getting towards more modern things here, right? This is almost postmodern, so very stylized uh, elements. Again, quite um, uh, impactful decoration. Um, but, um, you know, you have this very, very vertical building, very horizontal one, depending on the use, and uh, they're getting some more modern feels in there. Um, this is Bob and Pligidus in, uh, in Budapest and in Eiger in Munich. So, you know, this spread, uh, you can still understandably spread more in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the German Empire. Interestingly, uh, if you go to northern Italy, this, the, the, the quirky new architecture of this period is about 50-50 between Art Nouveau and Jugendstil, because it was under, at this point, a lot of the capital that was coming into Italy was from Germany and France. And so it's kind of 50-50. And interestingly, too, for Britons, uh, these, these styles altogether in Italy are generally referred to as Liberty, from Liberty, because the Liberty prints were very popular. And it's, they're associated in people's minds with the same artistic aestheticist movement. And this is Hoffman. Now Hoffman is usually referred to as one of the Jugendstil uh, architects. And he did build a couple of Jugendstil things. But this, in 1905, 20 years before the, um, the uh, uh, Art, Art Deco exhibition, is, in my mind, clearly an Art Deco building. If I told you this was a 1925 building and you didn't know who Joseph Hoffman was, I said, this is an early Art Deco building. It's an Art Deco building. He squared it off enough, he's taking enough ornament away, and, and, and we organize it in such a way that I'm convincingly you see that link. And the reason I mention this is that you might remember from the presentation quite a while ago about Art Deco that the idea used to be that there was this clear break because of World War I between Art Nouveau, you can still, and Art Deco. And I think there actually are some elements of continuity, certainly of influence. And that's, that's why I showed you this building. Again, some details. More Art Deco than Art Nouveau, in my opinion. This is the same building, the Stockley Palace in Brussels. Now, are all these styles that I just talked about Art Nouveau? Very often, in the current historiography, they're just seen as regional variations of the same thing. I think there's some important stylistic differences. Uh, there's also, you know, a chronological difference. I mean, modern style of modernism may happen, you know, almost 10 years before Art Nouveau. You can still and yet, Art Nouveau, you can still borrow only lightly from those two other styles. So I, I think that there are expressions of, this, of a very similar sentiment, a very similar spirit, but they're sufficiently different enough that I think they deserve to be considered parallel, um, different styles, although they have similar aspirations and inspirations. Now we get to the proper modern stuff, <laughs> right? And, you know, it's interesting, if you look at books written about the history of European architect, Western architecture, in the first half, or around, around the middle of the 20th century. You know, there's this clear progression, you know, there's the Gothic, the Renaissance, the Baroque, and then, and then all of a sudden there's a chapter on American architecture, like it's a separate thing. Um, and that's because being a new country, it was adding people and GDP and ideas at an unprecedented pace in Western history. 
it's not strange that it developed an even more uh, vividly modern and, 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 and an alternative view on architecture. And so here we got the Chicago School, which again goes back to the 1880s, so precedes slightly Art Nouveau. Started in Chicago, it was a very industrial, very new, very raw town. It then moved to the rest of the US, but really mostly stayed in the Midwest. There's very little of, of this, this kind of school in New York. And where architects of the Chicago School built in New York, they built in a much more traditional style, because otherwise they wouldn't have gotten the, 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 um, the brief. Uh, influenced by cast iron and industrial architecture, also by the fact that in 1871, Chicago burned to the ground. Now they needed to build up things quickly. Um, and also influenced by Richardson, who really built historicist buildings, but in such a different way that, that it gave, I think, and also in such an original way. So this is the first time I, Richardson, if you don't know him, built a lot of uh, uh, new Romanesque buildings. But again, a very inventive, very new way. And it's probably, I would argue, and most architectural historians, I think, would agree, it was the first American architect to influence architects outside of the US. Typically, they just borrowed things from Europe. And he was the first architect where, you know, Germans especially took notice and said, OK, we build buildings like his and copied him. So he's very influential in the US. And some of the architects you'll have heard about are uh, Sullivan, of Adler and Sullivan, the Baron Jenny, and you know, Burnham, Root, and all these other guys. It was also known as the commercial style because it was built mostly for commercial buildings, practical, let's not spend a huge amount of money. Very advanced, efficient construction techniques, so forefront of technology. Uh, less so at the beginning, but as time went by, more and more uh, very simple and very structurally, statistically legible. Uh, very vertical in terms of the uprights and, and the massing, but the windows much more horizontally developed, including the famous Chicago window, which I'll, I'll show you in a bit. And, and this is the period where we get the famous quote, that form ever follows function. This is the law, italicized by, by, by the author. That's Sullivan, that's Lewis Sullivan. So when somebody says form follows function, that's Sullivan saying the buildings need to look like what they do, okay? Now, one of the earliest um, is the, the later buildings by the Baron Jenny, iron frame, lifts, tons of glass, virtually no decoration. This is an 1879 building. The average warehouse in Victorian time had tons of decoration relative to this building. Um, it's mostly iron frame, but the regulators were a bit nervous, and so they imposed that at least one of the one wall should be built out of masonry you know, to hold the rest of the building up. Uh, <laughs> He then went on to build the Home Insurance Building, which is generally regarded as the first skyscraper. Now, there's a little bit of, of historicist ornamentation there, but it's all iron, load-bearing, reinforced concrete for all the internal structures, stone and terracotta cladding all over the iron, because they found out that when fire started, I, you know, cast iron buckles, and then the buildings collapsed, so you need to, to clad them. It was built at 10, then 12 stories, which is quite high at the time. And it was calculated that it weighed one-third of what a masonry building of the same size would have built. So imagine the savings in time and money. So these are buildings begin to be built with a theory of modernity in advance, but also, you know, very pragmatically, you know, cheaper. Uh, and you can see here during the construction, you know, I mean, it's, this stuff is, is cladding, but it's, it's, it's purely metal structure. Another important building, 13 stories, iron steel frame. This is the first one where it was all the uh, steel elements and iron elements were riveted. Uh, usually they just do some more complicated pouring and so forth. Uh, and, th and this is the first building where the facade is a curtain wall, i.e. it's built like a, like a modern office building. You have a steel structure and then you attach something here from each floor plate going down to the next floor plate. So these th you can take all these things off and the building yeah, it got, gets a bit windier but it doesn't really affect the building. Okay, it's just it's just like a it's a very thin outside cladding. This is thick outside cladding. This is a curtain wall. Um, Sullivan, Wainwright building. If you look at the grid design, I mean, it's got some nice sweet ornament here. Because that's a bit Art Nouveau-ish, historicist maybe. But if you look at this building, this is a modern office building. A grid of windows, boom, 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 boom. You know, uh, larger windows downstairs. Very rational. Um, it has a tripartite organization, which continued for many years as a base, a middle, and a top. 
but you know they're 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 approximated. You know, you, you can easily lose this. Um, and this building I find extraordinary. This is a building from 1891. It looks like a 1970s building. <laughs> Does it not? I mean, that massing there, the windows, you know, is just. Now, this was actually made with load-bearing brick, bizarrely, although there's a lot of, uh, so it's one of the heaviest buildings built of brick in the world, uh, and pyramids and things like that. Uh, but, but in terms of massing and arrangement, style, so not so much technologically, it's almost a brutalist building. It's incredible that they built a building like this in 1891. So you can see the Chicago School was really the precursor of um, minimalist or international style modernism. I mentioned the Chicago window before. If you've seen every door room and crappy 1970s office, they'll have a window like that. It's fixed in the middle and two smaller windows on the side that might open. That's a Chicago window. It's their fault. They invented it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the Chicago it, window. Yeah, you know, it, it, well, so it has a lot of uh, useful properties because once you start having a world where you have air conditioning and central heating, you know, you, you don't need, I mean, in many offices, do you know you keep the window open, like wide open? You know, it's not, it's not a little office in the city built of brick in the 1800s or 1700s, right? So there are practical aspects, and also it's harder to jump out, <laughs> importantly. We have a lot of types of buildings. You'd be surprised at how many buildings that is a design consideration. Uh, certainly holds a residence. You cannot build a, build a whole residence with windows open enough for people to jump out. They, they would not be allowed by any reasonable, um, um, or in any place that is, is in local priorities, um, regulator. Well, the prairie style, the last one we're going to talk about tonight, again in the US, again in the Midwest, which is much less tradition bound, uh, is much more American and less European. This actually begins in the early 1900s, but there was so much stuff in the 20th century I thought I'd put it into this part. Um, this was, it was influenced by a number of um, modern or artistic interpretations of vernacular styles, like the shingle style, arts and crafts. Japanese houses very much so, and even just a settler's ranch has, you know, and it has built out of, of, of blocks of grass in the Midwest, very horizontal, very simple. The most famous architect is Frank Lloyd Wright, there were a number of other practitioners. Now Wright, again, like Otto Wagner, built in tons of different styles, but he invented wholesale prairie style, and that's what made him famous, and that's when he was the most well-known and successful. So a huge emphasis on horizontality, it's in the States, right, they've got tons of room in the Midwest, you don't need to build up. You know, Chicago, in the middle of Chicago you do, but in the suburbs you can just spread out. Deep overhangs, ribbon windows, quite horizontal, low ceilings, especially Frank Lloyd Wright, who's a tiny man. He built these. <laughs> and for some reason, so many of his clients who were rich Midwesterners were these big six foot four galoots, you know, they had to kind of <laughs> walk like this when they have. Uh, very simple exteriors, although the, the interiors uh, are quite sophisticated. Not so much in terms of having lots of carved ornament, but, but, but beautiful stained glass, polished wood inlay, so a bit more, a bit simpler, a bit more modern, but, 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 not, but not cheap looking. Yeah, he didn't build cheap. Open plan. Uh, he, you know, this is where, borrowing from the Japanese tradition where you have removable screens, he creates uh, habitations that aren't divided in lots of little rooms, but tend to be a bit more open plan, and, and very rectilinear, very few curves. And he's one of the first adopters of this type of organic architecture. You mentioned before, an organic style. You know, native character to the environment, married to the ground, you know, simplicity, very modern concepts. One of the early ones is uh, Hurtley House in, in, in Chicago. He built a ton of buildings in Chicago. Um, and uh, this is most famous single house, Roby House. This is actually a three story high house, but if you look at it from the outside, because it's this is set back, and it's just so horizontal with the banding of the windows, it really feels like quite low on the ground, even though it's not that low. Um, you know, 1909, again, you know, most people in 1909 were building things that were much more florid than this, and so this is quite a super modern. Uh, this is a rare example in the prairie style of a, of a public building. This is a Unity Temple. You can see some Yugen still um, influences here for sure. And, and again, Now, I think all of these styles influence each other. I don't think that to some degree. Um, and they were happening roughly at the same time. I mean, there was some chronological succession. 
And I think they're all modern. I think, I think I've argued successfully, I hope, I hope I've argued successfully, that even though they're very different and they don't all clearly lead up to the Bauhaus, some of them lead quite apart from the Bauhaus, they're all very modern in spirit and in form, and, 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 and they're at the beginning of something different. It's also important to remember, I've, I've, I've mentioned this many times, but I want to show it to you in pictures, that most buildings built at the end of this period look more like this, okay? Now, as you know, I actually prefer these, but that's a completely different, that's not history, that's just my opinion. The idea was that Beaux-Arts style, which was a late Edwardian, um, quite rich, quite uh, dignified, but also ornate form of neoclassicism, was what most important buildings got built like. So all these other buildings we've looked at at the time were quite challenging, were quite modern, were quite different from the norm. And, you know, in, in the very city of Chicago, where the Chicago School starts, that the uh, famous exhibition in 1897, and they built this huge um, exhibition park, referred to as the White City, um, and they, they use the same name when they built the White City here in London, and it was generally neoclassical, okay? And, and Sullivan, <laughs> much later, in 1922, said that because of that, 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 that the Beaux-Arts and the White City <laughs> had, set, had, had set architecture back for half a century, if not longer. So, you know, while all these styles, all these people were working on something very different and very self-consciously modern, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of building, a lot of briefs, um, you know, were built in a way that actually refreshed memory and, and, and place and, uh, and, and, and identity much more than perhaps even a borrowed identity because, I mean, there weren't a lot of classical buildings in Britain, you know, uh, until the Romans got there. Uh, you know, but, but the idea that, you know, this, this, was, this was a good way to build. And so it was in, 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 in reaction to this and in opposition to this that all these other styles existed, and that's important to remember. And that's the end of the first part. <laughs> Well, what a, what a terrific and always informative architect. I was in D Washington, D.C. last year, and it feels more like an imperial capital than London. Everything in D.C. is huge, white marble, stretching on in every decoration, and there are friezes of quite literally native peoples paying tribute to Americans on the walls of these things. It's, uh, and the, the most interesting architecture is hidden in the margins of D.C. They clearly weren't building along these ones. I've just got one question. You might not know. What is the wealth differential between somebody in 1880, 1890 commissioning one of these buildings and somebody now commissioning something similar? So near me is a secret nuclear bunker, Keldon Hatch nuclear bunker, <laughs> which you can wander around. Would have been the regional command centre, an intensely depressing experience, but well worth it. Um, that cost £1 million to build in about 1955 and would now cost at least £100 million to build. So do you have any idea of what it, you know, how rich would you have to be to commission, find your favorite architect or build something like that today? So construction costs have gone up more than consumer price inflation, considerably more, because construction is still involves a tremendous amount of human labor, okay? Except for the, the most mundane sort of shed type warehouses, okay? Um, An Amazon warehouse is cheap to throw up. Yes, so Amazon warehouse is extremely cheap to throw up. But if you start using masonry and bits that are not just, you know, Lego blocks, yeah. essentially, um, you're using expensive labor. So like a lot of things, oh, that's like say, tailoring uh, has gone up more in price than, 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 uh, than many things. So that's comparatively more expensive than it was then. Uh, real incomes, I'm just spitballing here. Yeah. What I remember from my days as an economic historian was something like the 1818, 1890s, let's say in a rich country like the UK or the US, which were two of the, rich, the two richest countries per capita at the time, would, would be roughly four and a half, five times in real terms, what it was that. So we're much, much richer than they were. Yeah. Uh, but that's measuring it over all the goods. And so some things <laughs> like, like mass-produced clothing are, are in relative terms a fraction of the cost they used to be. Food is much cheaper than it used to be. I mean, scarily cheaper than it used to be. If you go back to like Tudor times, food is basically 10 times as expensive as it is now in terms of the amount of hours you need to work. Or no, 20, 25. It's just a different scale of magnitude. Uh, but but building nice buildings, even modernist buildings that have bits and bobs that aren't standardized, you have to make just for that building, is expensive. 
Um, but it's not that we don't have the money to build. We can yeah. easily afford to build buildings like these, um, and we do. Because when you see a building by Lieberskin, right, that has 55 different angles and overhangs without collapsing, hopefully, uh, you know, that's not the same. It's glass and steel, but it's not the same as a glass and steel box built yeah. in a cheap office park. Building like that costs and more health and tens of now, millions. Which costs more money to make yeah. sure the bit like when they wanted that masonry wall, there's now more of that to make sure a bit yeah. like when the the yeah, talkie was setting fire to cars. The 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 the, the construction cost. The other thing to remember is that construction costs now include a lot of things that are in construction. So I actually saw this. I read about this just yesterday. Um, they're, they're putting up a public toilet in San Francisco. There are there are all homeless people in San Francisco, and the, you know if they have a bathroom, you know. It gets pretty nasty, and so somebody, so the city said, we're going to build uh, a public toilet, and quite a modern one that is easy to clean, da 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 da. And the budget it was like one point seven million, and which took a fair amount of money. And so a company said, we'll donate it. You know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll donate all the material, the construction, and she said, okay, now it only cost one point two million. <laughs> the construction is five hundred thousand. What's the one point two million? And and I'm not joking. It was the risk assessment, the project management, uh, you know, there are 55 different levels of law that you have to make sure you're city liability, that, city right? building. So yeah. to build a, a toilet that costs $500,000, in San Francisco it costs $500,000 to build a toilet, it's a, it's a big, biggish, you know, concrete thing. It's not just a flimsy, you know, port mm. uh, with, with the security doors and blah, 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 so it doesn't get vandalized. But in 1.2 million, so maybe that's one of the differences now it costs so much is yeah. that you know, uh, they built the Empire State Building with 1920s technology, including the demolition and the foundations, in 18 months. It would take now three and a half years to build a building like that. But how many people died in the Empire State? Uh, about 15. Oh. The blood in the mortar helps the building stick together. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been very, I've been very self-indulgent about that. Uh, I would say, just on little architectural tools, if you go down to Tottenham Court Road Station, have your back to the theatre and look up and to the right above the Burger King, there is clearly a platform for sacrificing people. <laughs> I have no idea why it's there, but have a look. <laughs> and, sure you do. And, yeah, yeah. Any questions at all from anybody? <laughs> no, I can see Renee writing down sacrificial altar, Tottenham Court Road. Yeah. It's on the route to Tyburn, so that's probably why it's there. Thank you again very much, Luca. Tremendous speech. And to get out, you have to buy a ticket at £25 for part two. Thank <laughs> <laughs>